Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. Anyone who's serving in the legislature or works around the legislature, I think, is staring this issue right in the face. If you're spending a lot of time reading through paperwork, understanding things, hearing from constituents and various groups all year round. And so that's what's kind of demanded of this job. And we're paying folks, what, 30 grand? It's just not enough. And so I think the loss, you know, the folks that it drives out are young people, BIPOC folks, people with kids. And I think that's a real loss because you lose the voices that would otherwise stand up and say, hey, here's what real Oregonians are facing in any corner of the state. All right, folks, uh, today we had a very fun interview. I think you all are going to enjoy this conversation. Uh, Today, I got to speak with Kathleen Stewart. Kathleen has held um, several very important high profile jobs in the Oregon campaign world. Um, she was a leader at the Senate Democratic Leadership Fund and the executive director of Future PAC. Those are the two um, campaign arms of the House and Senate Democratic caucuses, as we discussed in this episode. She also ran the coordinated campaign, um, which we talk about in this episode. If, you, if you're not familiar with the coordinated campaign, it's like all of the campaigns running for a political party working together, coordinating their efforts to advance their mission. So she did all of that on the Democratic side. Um, She's worked inside the legislature. She's worked outside the legislature. She now owns her own um, firm called Stewart Collective, which we talk about a little bit. Uh, But she's had a very interesting trajectory in her professional career in Oregon politics. Um, We talk about legislator pay and compensation. We talk about the campaign world. Um, It's a very interesting conversation, particularly for a politics first crowd who's interested in campaigns and how political strategy works. Uh, We dive into a lot of that. Uh, And it was super fun to talk to Kathleen. I've worked with her before, and uh, I think you're all going to enjoy what she has to say. So thanks so much for listening to the Oregon Bridge and enjoy this week's episode with Kathleen Stewart. Now that the legislative session is over, it's time for Oregon's activists, candidates, and political committees to turn their attention to the 2024 elections. With government regulation of political activities becoming more complicated nearly every year, and with political actors increasingly initiating complaints and litigation to achieve political goals, having experienced legal counsel has become critical to success in the political arena. Harang Long PC has represented clients involved in candidate and ballot measure elections for decades. To learn more about Harang Long's political law practice, check out our website at harang.com. That's www.harrang.com. All right, Kathleen Stewart, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Ben, for having me on. I was just, I'm basically kicking off before we hit record, just saying like how much of a fan I am. And thank you for having me on. <laughs> this thank is you, my second you. ever podcast, so I'm getting my feet Oh, well, well, what was your first one? Um, oh man, my team got me on Sexy Politi- Politicos, which is a podcast out oh. of the out of the Midwest, and I was like, "This is." I was just embarrassed, but it was a wonderful podcast. <laughs> that sounds like an awesome podcast that I would be unfortunately ineligible to uh, participate on. I don't think I fall in the sexy political. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, please don't, please don't post this. I'm embarrassed, <laughs> but she was lovely. It was great. Yeah, thanks again for having me on. I'm a huge fan of the work so- you're doing here. So I was looking, you were recently selected for the uh, Portland Business Journal's 40 Under 40. Uh, congratulations. And I was reading some of your 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 background, like your trajectory, how you got to where you got to. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But what I found particularly interesting was like, you after you graduated, you went into the PR world. Like you weren't working directly in politics. It seems like you were working in like private sector space. And then yeah. you make what I think is probably a pretty significant jump to go from that culture and that type of work to yeah. the political world. Um, so I'm, I was curious what what motivated that transition. Yeah. Um, and clearly you liked it because you haven't gone back, I don't think. Um, yeah. But what, what, what was what was going through your mind when you're like, you know what, I want to move to politics? Yeah. Yeah. So I was working at a PR firm. Um, by the time I made the transition, I was mostly doing tech PR, but some also some corporate Mm-hmm. PR and you know I loved the fast pace I love the pace I love the team element it was it's really collaborative I mean in so many ways you know there's a lot of writing there's a lot of project management PR and politics are actually not that dissimilar and I joke a lot of times that 
if you want to make a hire in politics, you should hire someone who um, either has worked at a coffee shop, like been a barista, because oh. those folks know how to hustle, or somebody out of a PR firm. Um, oh, that's and, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's just that, that, you know, that that spirit of like, let me just get this done. Mm-hmm. Um and so, you know, I was working, but I was working in tech PR and corporate PR and, you know, you're, you're working, I like the environment, but you're hustling to kind of felt like to me, like, Hey, I'm kind of selling widgets and like pushing, you know, pushing program, but it didn't feel like the kind of big change that I, that I wanted to be part of and say like, Hey, I'm doing this. So, um, and all power to all those PR folks who are doing all that hard work too. And no shade to that. So, For sure. um, but yeah, I, um, I just felt like, you know, I wanted to, to lend that time and effort into, into working in politics. And I come from a really political family. So for me, it was like, huh. oh wait, that's what's missing from my work. It's like the fact that I'm not talking about workers and people and, you know, I wasn't like doing the political piece as part of my work. So when you- I always had my eye on, you know, kind of becoming politics plus communications, but I, at the time I thought, well, let me just jump and, um, and we wanted to move back to Oregon. And so I came up during spring break one year and just knocked on the time. It was Melissa Unger running future pack and Tom yep. Powers running the Senate democratic leadership fund. And I said, you know, here's my resume. I really want to work with you. I was like, you know, just putting myself at their doorsteps, like, please, you know, can I please have a campaign manager position? Um, and, uh, you know, Tom hired me to run Lori Montes Anderson, Senator Montes Anderson's oh, that's campaign right. that's right. out in East County, which was a swing big district. Just, it was a swing district. Yeah. And it was, I was excited. I was so excited. Um, and I just like totally did like everything I could. I like, I just loved it. And I was so excited. So, um, that was my first uh, so, chance to work in So to fall first, I pretty sure. So was that, was that 14, 2014? Yeah, it was, uh, 12, it was 12, 2012. Okay. I think that is the yeah. year that I was a campaign services assistant for future pack, yes! um, <laughs> which yeah, seems really? so funny. That's uh, so funny. Yeah. So y- you also said you come from a political family and I'm always very curious yeah. about it. Does this mean like parents worked in politics or like politics was discussed at the dinner table or like what, what does that mean for you? Yeah, probably like a lot of folks. I mean, they talked about it at the dinner table, but my dad was a um, local union bargainer. He led the union uh, bargaining uh-huh. team for our uh, school district. And I'm from Alaska and this little tiny rural town, in Alaska, and like surrounded by mountains. And my husband, when he got there, he was like, oh, this is way smaller than I expected. It was like one <laughs> stoplight, you know, it was two maybe, but yeah, it's small. And, um, you know, our, but, but that area is the most, one of the more populated areas in, in, um, in Alaska. And there's a lot of teachers, you know, there's a lot of services in that area. So they, he, rep, you know, helped bargain for all those teachers. And so, I grew up like I show up at middle school and the teacher would be like, oh, th- thank your dad for the contract, you know, we got or, you know, we'd be at the picket line or like licking envelopes. And so sometimes I joke that I like huh. grew up underneath the bargaining table because I like <laughs> yeah. show up for the diet Pepsi, you know, like, oh, sweet, I get a diet Pepsi <laughs> while I wait for bargaining. So that's just kind of how I grew up. And, you know, I knocked doors like in the snow, you know, like trudging through the snow. I mean, a couple of times, let's be clear. I wasn't <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, but I just kind of like part of, you know, it's like, hey, we. You know, and, you know, early on when I was in high school, the school board uh, voted to privatize uh, the all the um, service workers. So all the um, janitor, oh. janitorial staff and so forth. And a whole bunch of folks lost their jobs who we knew, like our neighbors and our, you know, folks in our community. Um, and, you know, my my dad, my family weren't part of that union, but, you know, it was awful watching folks lose their jobs. And. Um, all these jobs being privatized. So we um, we went out and we flipped that school board. So every single person who voted to uh, privatize to that school board lost their jobs and we got a pro, you know, pro worker school board back and those folks got their jobs back. So that that was like early for me. So when I think about like workers and people, I'm like, yeah, let's like make sure this happens. To That's awesome. It, I've been, I've been, there's a, I'm reading a, a book about uh, Bobby Kennedy and um, part of the book talks about how like at the dinner table, there's like these, intense conversations about current events and you're expected right. to know something when you're sitting at the table and right. I don't have kids I don't have kids yet I think you you have one or two I have two yeah you have two so I I mean they're they're too little probably yeah. to be you know weighing in on Ukraine and, and Libya uh, yeah. and all that. But, but like do you, do you expect politics to be part of like how you bring them up you know, I'm kind of, maybe I'm an anomaly. I don't know if this is normal, but like ask anybody who knows me, like I don't talk politics. Like I don't talk oh, about really? Ukraine. No, I know that's weird. And I, I mean, maybe that's a fault. You know, maybe I should spend time like talking politics. I just feel like I want to spend that time taking action. And I like uh-huh. to 
do, you know, like I could talk about Ukraine or I could like, you know, and, and that there's reason for that. Like people should know about Ukraine and current events, but like, I really want to like spend that time going out and like knocking doors and like hell raising and getting stuff done, like passing bills. And like, I just find that people are in need and like, I want to go do stuff about it. So when I talk to my kids about, I don't like, we don't talk, we talk about climate change. We talk about, you know, just like, but I try not to scare them with it. I try to be like, Hey, we try to be of service in the community. Like yeah. we try to, I, I mean, that. we also just do our fair share of sitting around. So but we try to, <laughs> yeah, sure. try to do good stuff. <laughs> okay. So, so going back to career stuff, I, it feels like yeah. you, like, cl- I don't want to say yeah. climb the ladder, but you get promotions yeah. very quickly, right? Like within, it seems relatively quickly, you're like running, you were your, S- your SDLF deputy director. Is that, was that the first kind of like big thing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, um, yeah, so I did that campaign and then I worked in the Senate majority office and then I, um, and then I went out and worked for the Senate on the campaign trail as Tom's deputy, Tom Powers again. So you're Tom's deputy, then like yeah. the, the is it the next cycle your future pack ed um the next cycle did i sit out yeah 14 i ran yeah well 12 14 i was in the senate and 16 i ran future pack future and pack. i did a stint in between that um at the oregon healthcare association i saw then, i didn't i didn't know you were at oka but i saw it on your linkedin i was yeah, like oh that's yeah, interesting. yeah i love those uh, guys they're so good at what they do i mean it's like kind of crazy how good they are sometimes. and then and then you you ran the coordinated campaign in 2018. Uh huh. Oh man, that yeah, yeah. I won't get off topic. So, I was six months old that cycle, and it was oh, it almost oh. broke me. I was so like, what did I do? Let's start with the so yeah. so each so House Democrats have a um, campaign arm. House Republicans have a cam- campaign arm. Same for but so all four caucuses yeah. have like a campaign arm. Can you explain like what? the executive director, what the person who runs the campaign arm for these caucuses, like, what is that job? The non-legislative side, right? Like, cause you're not, there's yeah. pretty firm boundaries, right? You're not in the totally. building. You're not like guiding legislation. You're doing something completely separate. How does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, well, and but I came out of the campaign side in 2012 and into the building and I was a, you know, full-fledged building staffer. And I was working for the majority office for Diane Rosenbaum. And I, sat in the back corner. I joke, they put me in the closet and I was like the outreach director. Uh, and I would, you know, instead of, and that's another thing, like, you know, you're like, well, you get promoted quickly, but like in each of those jobs, I think back at how hard I worked. And it was like, sometimes I look back and think like, oh man, I wish I could give past self a hug and be like, dude, like totally. chill. A little. Totally. Like, it'll be cool. But like, instead of sitting in that closet, I would like roam the, the building, like getting to know people and talking oh, and, and honestly, like getting gossip and bringing it back, which like most majority office staffers are, you know, just like, Hey, what's going on out there in the world? You know, let me find out and, you know, help. And, and, you know, we have swing members in the building. So I was talking to their staff and help making sure their office was running well and, and you know, all that stuff. Um, so, but, but I hated being in the building. I hated it. Oh, really? So I did not know this. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. That's why I don't lobby now. Like I, I kind of like will lobby on the periphery sometimes and I'll register if I'm doing any sort of chatting with legislators, but I, I try not to be in the building. I what just, did you hate about it? I don't like, it moves too slowly for me. Oh, <laughs> probably as a le- You know, for legislators, it's moving quickly, but as a staffer, I was like, oh man, you know, I want to. I wanted to go, you know, yeah. I, I, I just get like that. Being I totally trip. get that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've been on both sides too. Do you have a preference? Which one you like? I mean, I definitely prefer uh, the legislator side. Like, I, I think I probably had similar frustrations of like, you know, like when yeah. you're, when you're a staffer, when you're a staffer, your, your job is to advance the vision and the goals of your boss right. and to try to help inform those right. and shape those to the best yeah. of your ability. Um, but you don't actually have the ability to like make, well, you can make some decisions. It's a mixed bag. I think like, I'm very glad I was a staffer before I was yeah. a legislator. I'll say that yeah. because I feel like yeah. I knew, you know so I knew much. the pacing, I knew the, the structure. Um, yeah. but we're actually like, the, the like really enjoy is the ability to like in the interim you like are just designing what are we going to work on you know you start right. from a blank sheet of paper and everyone's pitching right. you their ideas yeah. like I, I love that part of it which is probably similar to how it works on your space now like you've got people from all different sectors kind of like pitching you on we want to work on these things 
Totally. Yeah. And I always got excited. You know, I'd go into a member's office and they'd have like a whiteboard. Like, here's our 15 bills and we've passed yes. seven. I was like, oh, you know, those kind of offices are exciting. Maybe, you know. For um, sure. Yeah. And, you know, the so just to get back to your question, the majority offices serve as, you know, they're, the majority office or the minority office are of the party that they're um, mm -hmm elected by. So they're um, naturally more partisan and naturally a little more political than your average office. And they serve all their members. So a majority office, you know, right now would serve all the Democrats in the House or Senate. And, you you know, you know this well. And so um, you're kind of working with all those members at the same time, making sure they get what they need. And, um, you know, you're not talking about what happens out of the building per se, but there's definitely, a, you know, an awareness in those offices of like, here's what's going on. So um, you know, and, the, and then you've got the outside the building folks that, you know, report to either the speaker or the minority leader or the majority leader. Um, and they'll report to them, but in a, in a different, you know, capacity. And so, um, yeah, what those roles are, right, Future PAC and SDLF, and then on the um, Republican side, they have very similar organizations, is that they're serving all those members and ensuring that they either, you know, they're either working to get the majority or working to maintain it and grow it. Um, and working with those same members, right, to make sure they get what they need. They're tracking when the races are tough. They're helping the candidates who are in these dicey, tight races. I mean, you spoke with two swing members or mm -hmm. two swing candidates last um, last podcast. I listened to it was awesome. And um, you know, you're coaching them. You're you're recruiting them. You're coaching them. You're training them. You're helping them win. Um, but there's a whole bunch that goes into that, right? The relationship building and the um, in just a lot of difficult conversations and, and a lot of hard work. For sure. And I, I have no idea what it was like in uh, 2016 when you ran it, but I, I know that on both sides, there's oftentimes uh, probably healthy tension between swing seat candidates and like the uh, caucus staff, because the caucus staff yeah. is like, we need you to make calls. We need you to hit doors. And the swing members are yeah. like, I am exhausted. And all I do is this campaign. And it's like, we know you have to do that. Uh, <laughs> but I've always found that funny. <laughs> And I was thinking about this it's actually because this is one of the things I was going to ask you about is like yeah. candidate recruitment, because yeah. I think it actually ties into what a big topic that we're going to talk about in a moment, which is like legislator pay, the condition, the working conditions yeah. of a legislator. What is the what was your pitch when you were talking to like potential candidates in 2016? Like, like, how do you yeah. how do you sell the potential job of being a legislator to someone sure. who like I think there's people like me who have worked in and around politics for a long time, yeah. like we kind of get it. We we, right. we maybe have wanted to do this for a while. But a lot of the people in, in particularly successful candidates, like I would say yeah. Anessa Hartman and Emerson sure. Levy, like they're not sure. I grew up in politics and it's all I've ever wanted to do. They like are yeah. real people with real lives and real jobs yeah. and real families. Yeah. So like, and that's what, the ideal legislator, right? You want somebody who's just like of the community. You know? For I sure. Mean, there's a reason so, I don't want to. Nobody wants me to be a legislator. <laughs> <laughs> be careful. Be careful. They'll ask. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, now you're, and you're, you're, I mean, you really came up in politics too. And look at you. So. But so what do you, what, what would you, what, what were those conversations like? Like, how do you talk about the role of a legislator to someone who's like new to the space and maybe doesn't know what they're getting themselves into? I know. I know. Well, the reason I, maybe I, I feel a little, um, I feel a little torn about this because um, I look back at how I did it in 14 and 16 and 18 and like, and I've done a lot of recruitment in and around that, right? Like I think we're all kind of involved in the recruitment process. And, um, you know, I look back at what I did and there's some like obvious flaws, right? Like the way um, in 14, we were just learning, um, you know, I would, Teresa Alonzo Leon was running for the very first mm -hmm. time. And um, she uh, had a lot of really, her in the community in that area had a lot of innovative ideas about bilingual campaigns and more community led movement building campaigns. And I'd been trained, you know, and I was, I was fresh, you know, I'd only been at it for a couple of cycles. I was a good like doer and I was, you know, I built relationships and all of that. I was good at getting stuff done and leading a team, but I, you know, I'm, I was no like expert, you know, I was really like, you know, I was good at building a team. We had consultants around and all the, this team. So um, uh, I look back at what we did and I was trained in this, like, this is the way we do it, but it was hard to evolve at the time and go, Hey, the way we've done it may not serve this candidate or it may not serve future candidates. And I think, that's the kind of, you know, so I look back on that with a little bit of like, Ugh, and I, she and I have talked about that. I learned a lot that cycle and that was huh. a long time before, you know, the conversations we've all, the 
the hard conversations we've had now about anti-racism and, um, you know, and we're still learning and evolving all the time. And so anyway, I look back at that and then I look at what's happening now, right? Like, or, I don't know if you saw Oregon Futures Lab came out with a really great report. I where did they, see that. Yeah. Maybe. Have you already talked about that on the podcast? No, we haven't. We actually should. I saw um, yeah. Representative Ricky Ruiz was yeah. quoted in the Capital Chronicle article. Thought, so yeah, like it, it, oh. it paints a pretty stark picture. It really does. And I mean, others should and can speak to that. But, um, you know, I think it's been kind of this like underlying secret, like we're not um, the way we're recruiting and the way we're training is built was built 20 years ago. And we haven't totally evolved. And the way that we're um, recruiting candidates and talking to them and the way that we're supporting them once they're in office, we're not supporting them at all because there's no structure for that, Mm. I think is a real problem. And um, it's a pretty immediate problem. And so, um, I, you know, I look at how I've done it and I go like, man, I, I really, I'm excited about being part of that next version where we do it a little differently. I think that's what I I'm saying. That. So one more campaign question category before we talk about the compensation side. Um, yeah. Coordinated campaign. So in, 20, in 2018, the governor, I assume, calls you or someone from the governor's team calls you and says, yeah. hey, we have decided what your next job is going to be. <laughs> and- <laughs> you know how it works. You know how it works. They yeah. tell you, you don't ask. <laughs> so, well, and I like my first campaign in Oregon politics was 2010. 2010. It was Governor Kitzhaber's uh, cool. third term election. And I remember like how big and important and like I have I had nothing, nothing to compare it to. But like, it seemed like the coordinated campaign was this like incredibly big and impactful and important thing. And I'm trying to remember if there was a senator on the ballot in 2010. I don't remember. Um, But like the structure was like, can you explain how, what is the structure of the coordinated campaign? How does it, how does it work? Yeah, well, um, essentially it works, you know, the the party is really involved, right? So um, the party I think on, I think they do this on both sides, but on the democratic side, right. They'll pull in all these candidates and the ones of the, you know, the toughest races at the top of the ticket, you're really supporting them. And then um, really the goal, you know, governor, governor wants their same party or the gubernatorial candidate wants their same party on either side to win. So there's a lot of kind of uh, economies of scale and like working with everyone um, because I'd run future pack or as you know, help run SDLF, um, and then uh, ran Future Pack. By the time I got to the coordinated, it was like I'd kind of helped design a lot of the systems, or particularly sure. around fields. So um, it made a lot of sense for me to like, hey, I can kind of jump in, and I know exactly how GOTV runs, and I know exactly how both caucuses work. And, um, and so that that was really fun. That was a really fun part where everybody kind of comes together at the end and starts to really collaborate and like share you know and not just information but share um you know like economies like how do we kind of knock doors alongside each other instead of doubling up and how do we mm-hmm. um you know okay this ballot measure and this ballot measure you know on that cycle it was 104 105 106 so there's a lot of big ballot measures which, on were, the, the, which were those i don't remember i'd have to pull all the um names for you but um one was on choice one was on oh, immigration right, right. they were like really critical That's so right. we all That's needed right. them to win yeah. And so we, you know, they, each, each campaign had its own leader, like the future back had its own awesome director. SDLF had its own awesome director. Each ballot measure had its own campaign manager. Um, and in fact, that cycle was really fun because almost all the women running the governor's race, the, um, our Oregon, the coordinated me, and then future pack and each of the ballot measures were all being run by a woman <laughs> for the wow. first time. That's Super awesome. cool. We didn't realize that until the end, but you know, you kind of get to this point where like, Hey, you know, we're running things. Um, it was really collaborative. I think partly for that reason, there was just a lot of collaboration across the team. So, so that was, that was the, uh, Newt, Newt Bueller was the candidate in 2018. Um, yeah, he was running against. I think that's right. He was running against Kate Brown. I think that's right. Did you, yeah. so like throughout that campaign, I guess that was, that was Trump's first midterm. So was the vibe of that campaign, like, we feel really insane. good or was it like we no. could lose and the world is falling apart <laughs> it was insane and people and the volunteers were mad and like ever you know just uh. mad because they people were like angsty and they were turning out at one point um one of the partner staff <laughs> like took a drone i won't name them just you know <laughs> podcast but like yeah, took yeah. a drone over the crowd and there was a, a line of like a thousand people going out waiting to come into canvas it was just outrageous like, yeah and that cycle was tricky because 
one, people had big emotions, right? Like our, our side on the left, people were really upset. They were really angry. They felt like things had been, you know, the ball had been dropped the last cycle and they wanted to make sure we didn't do it again. So they would come in, like, be like, people would be mad about like a lawn sign, like this operation is not working because I didn't get my lawn sign, you know, three days ago. And you're like, dude, I'm, we're knocking doors, but there was just so much angst. And so that was pretty intense. And then um, it was, it wasn't, it was recruiting, you know, we needed volume, but it was more like, there was so much, the volume was so big, we had to manage it. So we were big, wow. like, you know, how do you set up a canvas station for 2000 people on a Saturday? Like, that it was is a nuts. great problem to have, but it yeah. was like, a, it took a lot of staff and we were pretty understaffed. It was, I, like I mentioned, I was six months old. I got a little over my skis on that cycle. Cause everyone was like, Kathleen can hit, you know, I just, yeah, it was busy. That sounds incredibly hard. They reminds me yeah. there's a, in, in 2010, one of my favorite stories was, um, uh, my, Jeff, uh, Jeff was the lawn sign guy on the Kitsaba campaign awesome. and the campaign, the people running the Kitsaba campaign were like you, they were like strategists, right? They're like, we don't, lawn yeah. signs don't vote, lawn signs don't win elections, like not a priority. They had actually the the flimsy, you know, those plastic cover lawn signs that you slip over, <laughs> like they're, they're just like, yeah. you know, fl super flimsy. I think I remember those, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were, so but Chris Dudley, who's the opponent, had like the the gigantic lawn signs all over rural Oregon, yeah. which is like a pretty traditional Republican tactic. They sure, had like big, sure, like sure. sturdy lawn signs. And Jeff was like, there's this debate about like, we need more lawn signs and people saying we don't need more lawn signs. And finally, <laughs> I'm pretty sure Jeff said something along the lines of like, you take it out of my salary, spend my salary to buy these lawn signs. We need the lawn signs. The people are demanding the lawn signs. Uh, and I think they'd compromise and bought like a small amount of lawn signs and put them on rural Oregon. And Kitsaba won. So who are we to doubt lawn signs? <laughs> that was a really tough race. Well, and that's the thing with Kate. It was like, it came right to the end. You know, the polling was like, oh my God. And then, you know, the whole message was like, well, Kathleen, I hope you don't f it up. Like we're all, you know, like, oh my God. And then, you know, we won by six points. I'm like, Okay, folks, like, you know, but, you know, each race, right, I'm up till 3 a.m. every night, you know, like, totally. yeah, I mean, I've all, and the other thing is, I think the, like, kind of residual, I think anybody telling, you know, any, like you, you've worked on campaigns, it takes you a while to, like, mentally come back and to, like, mm -hmm. you, your brain just gets going so fast, and God. then everything just kind of, you just, it's almost like people say that about law school, like, when you go to law school, you kind of, yeah. like, your brain gets kind of wonky for a while. It's like that every time. And it's really under discussed, I think, but it's really hard. So every time after that campaign, it took me a really long time to be like, okay, I'm a normal person. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, I'm actually adding another question before time because okay. I'm really curious. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you do jobs like that, running a caucus office, running a coordinated campaign, um, yeah one opportunity is usually like go work on the state side go work in the governor's office go work like mm -hmm. did you ever think about that or were you always pretty sure like i want to run my own firm and like do the private sector side like how did the post coordinated campaign professional dynamic yeah. shake out that's a good question well um i actually started my firm in 2017 because mm -hmm. i was um <laughs> i was I, I my husband and i decided to start a family so i had you know baby on the way and i thought I was looking at what I really love to do. And, you know, like in campaigns, there's kind of two, you know, you can work on these races and then go national and uh -huh. do national work. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be here in Oregon. I'm pretty close to my family on both sides of my, my husband's family too. And we'd moved back to Oregon, you know, from California. We went to school here and then came back, you know, went to California for a little bit and came back. So it was like, we'd made a choice. Like we want to be in Oregon. We want to be invested in this area. And the work that I love to do, the campaign, the kind of fast paced stuff, I was like, man, you know, there's not really a version where I like tone that down, um, you know, and unless I go in the building. And so um, when we decided to start a family, I thought, well, let me just do some contract stuff. I'll just, I'll just see if people will like hire me for a few things and then I'll see if it works. If it works, my mom got me a, a magnet said it leap and the net will, will appear. It's like yeah. this thing. It's still <laughs> on my coffee pot. I, I see it every that. morning. And so I was like, well, you know, what's the worst that can happen? I'll go knock on somebody's door and be like, please hire me, you know, like I did, you know, in 2012. Like, I need a job. Please hire me on this campaign. <laughs> I'm not above anything. So I thought, well, worst case scenario, I'll do that. Best case scenario, it'll work and I'll get to have some flexibility and also do the work that I like to do. Hmm. And then like six years later, here I am. I mean, I think the the thing is that um, 
Yeah, I mean, to to keep doing the work, it almost kind of, de- this work, contract work, from my perspective to do it the way I wanted to do it, it kind of demanded that I hire a team. And mm-hmm. I like having a team. I like to have a team of definitely collaborators. So I've just kept growing the firm and had a lot of fun doing that. So yeah, that's- So we're, we're going to get back to the firm, but I want to talk about the piece you wrote um, for the Oregon yeah. Away. The title was, Where Can Oregon yeah. Step Up to Support Women Serving in Office?, and one yeah. line that stuck out, st- stood out to me, every year Oregon is losing brilliant leaders who were devotedly engaged in policies that directly address their constituents' needs because they simply can't afford to continue serving in the legislature. What did yeah. you mean um, by that that line? Yeah, well, um, absolutely. Th- and thanks for asking. I mean, you know, anyone who's serving in the legislature or works around the legislature, I think, is staring this issue right in the face. I mean, you've got folks who are not only on the campaign, you know, someone like Anessa, just a point, you know, you know, the folks you've been interviewing, you know, they're running really tough campaigns. So that's one set. You don't get paid for that time. And then you're serving in the legislature and you've got this kind of year round job, just being a legislator, not to mention running in these tough races. Um, and then you're being asked to do things like write the state's budget and show up every day to vote on really tough bills. And like, the really great legislators, like, you know, I think you just, uh, well, I, I won't go into your work as a legislator, but I know <laughs> the ones who are getting high, you know, high accolades as their work as a legislator, you're spending a lot of time reading through paperwork, understanding things, hearing from constituents and, you know, gr- various groups all year round. And so that's what's kind of demanded of this job. Um, and we're paying folks, what, 30 grand, 29,000? 33. 33, I think, yeah. It's just, it's just not enough. And so I think the loss, you know, what, who that role is made for right now are folks who are on a pension, who have retired, like who have some other source of income, maybe they own their own business and they're also able to kind of moonlight as a legislator. You're not, you know, the folks that it drives out are young people, BIPOC folks, um, you know, people with kids, you know, family folks who have other obligations, even caregiving obligations, right, of any age or size or type of other obligations. And I think that's a real loss because you lose the voices that would otherwise stand up and say, hey, here's what real Oregonians are, are facing in any corner of the state. And and that, you know, and I'm talking about folks, you know, maybe we're thinking, you know, I work with a lot of, with Democrats. So you're talking about people who may be um, within a couple of hours of the state capital driving wise, mm-hmm. but you talk to somebody who's coming from Brookings, Oregon, you know, South Coast. Nope. You're yep. talking about a six and a half hour drive or a flight. Well, who's, you know, it's it's really challenging work. Um, and the other thing that I've been, you know, facing, you know, th- through the pandemic with some of our clients is these attacks to democracy that are happening, right? Yep. You've got, I mean, you know, you've got legislators, again, making $33,000 commuting in all of these pieces and they're facing threats. They're facing um, really, uh, you know, direct threats to them as legislators, um, moments in the state capitol where they've got riots outside. Um, and those have only ratcheted up, um, you know, through my work with Western State Center. I've been kind of watching those really closely. And I, I think just the demands of the job have changed and the job was never designed for the folks that we want to have serving right now. And that really, that concerns me a lot. So one thing I've been thinking about that I'm, I'm curious how you think about this tension. Yeah. The people who support the status quo, or maybe at one point supported the status quo, they're very proud of the fact that Oregon has a citizen legislature, a yeah. place where like, like we were talking about people with normal jobs and normal lives, like right. you know, take some right. time off. That was the original vision. They take some time yeah. off of work. They, yeah. they go to Salem for a few months, yeah. they make decisions, and then they go back. Um, and I think there's a fear from maybe the... Mm, conservative might be too strong of a word for the the skeptics but like folks who worry that it'll just be a bunch of professional politicians who like maybe don't represent the the occupations or lived experiences of people in the state if we move to professional i think there's reasons why that conception isn't fully accurate but i'm kind of curious what you think about that tension between like citizen legislature versus like compensating people for their work and making it accessible i i just think that argument um, it's really compelling. And I, I pause because I think there's got to be some solutions out there if we looked in other states or other places in the world where like they've they've created um, kind of a citizen first legislature, but also mm-hmm. allowed real citizens to take part. But mm-hmm. what you're having now are folks who you, you don't really have a citizen legislature. You have folks who, like I said, it works for folks with a pension or folks with 
businesses or someone else supporting them on the side. And so the people we're churning through, the really talented rock stars that are coming and going so quickly from the legislature are often folks who are those who make up that citizen legislature. And so I don't, I think that idea that we have a citizen legislature is sort of a, it's not really true anymore. I, I mean, I think we're trying, but I think we're burning out a lot of really talented folks and um, asking a lot of folks um, and not setting up. The other thing is that if we want a citizen legislature, you know, like look for ways one to kind of either require that or ask it of legislators who are running. Um, uh, the other way we could do it is, you know, I'm just like brainstorming now, but yeah, it yeah, just, yeah. Um, you know, do you require some sort of town halls? Do you inc encourage the, the you know folks to come into the legislature more often? What do you do to kind of make it more people forward, but also work for both the people who it's serving and the people who are serving within it? I love that. I actually think that's a super compelling framing is like legislator pay is, is about making the legislature a truly citizen legislature, right? Like it's actually about advancing the thing. It's not contrary to the thing. Um, yeah. yeah. That, but I do think like you, we do want to make sure that people like who have like, you know, people who are doctors, for example, um, or people who are, you know, business owners of which we've got several in both of those categories. Right. You don't want a legislature where they can't serve because they're unable to like do their private practice. They're unable to attend. Right. But like, I think it does seem true, at least in my, I mean, you, right. you and I, I think have similar like times. Yeah, where yeah. It does seem like the work of the legislature um, is more. Some people's theory is it's post pandemic, like during the pandemic, there were so many like special sessions yeah. and it was so constant with like constituents yes. and help with unemployment and it hasn't slowed down no. fully since then so it feels like a different job than it, it certainly is a different job than it yeah. was when we were yeah. founded but it seems like it's a different job than it was 20 or even 10 years ago right well and i think we're so quick to kind of like hold on to like quicksand to like old systems you know even the way like we recruit and train candidates that i was saying like man we've learned a lot and it's changed a lot like those systems the way we know them now at least on the democratic side were really set up like 20 30 years ago and we're for the most part we're like well that's the system that works well yeah, it's the system that's brought us to this point, but it's okay too for us to go, hey, folks involved, what works for you? Like if we sat down with a bunch of legislators today, I bet a quarter of them would say, we really need childcare in the building. Mm -hmm. A quarter of them would say, you know, we want, you know, a certain mandated number of virtual times. Um, another third would say, look, we're not actually, because we're a citizen legislature and we're grinding all, all year, we actually want to be, you know, having mandated in, in district time or something like, they'll have creative ideas. So we don't have to be wedded to the same systems we've used. I mean, I'm sure, I don't mean to pe preach to the choir. I'm sure no, no, you have no. your own thoughts on it. No, I think that's really interesting, actually, um, which actually brings me to my next yeah. question. So yeah. <laughs> the legislature, the legislature referred out this um, amendment that would create an independent public service compensation commission, which would set salaries for literally everybody, <laughs> governor, yeah. secretary of state, state treasurer, yeah. attorney general, labor commissioner, yeah. Supreme Court judge, uh, Supreme Court judges, all other judges, DAs, state senators, state representatives. Does this seem like the right approach in your mind of how to address this? Like there's one version was like the legislature just sets all the salaries and raises a bunch of pay. And the other yeah. was like referred out, allow voters to decide if they want basically private sector folks. No state employees would be on this compensation commission and yeah. let them determine what a fair number is. How do you think about like that um, solution that was landed on? Well, I think it's a way to get it done. I mean, I'm sure folks have nuanced ideas on, you know, is this the right way or not? But I mean, you know, I think you and I have both had a front seat to this conversation. It's been 10 years. We've all been like, legislator pay is too low. And now we're watching just like, I, I think kind of an exodus of some of these, you know, folks who I think really should be. And I'm really grateful to folks like you who are like, you're like, I'm hanging in there. So I'm really grateful to the folks who are, or who are serving and are doing this hard work. And I also, you know, I want to see everyone compensated fairly so they can continue to lean in and like learn and 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 change things the way that our state needs. And um and, and while we've all been saying, man, this needs to get done, everyone's looked at each other and go, I'm not voting on that. Well, I'm not yeah. voting on that. And you think, well, well, what the hell do you need to get this thing done? <laughs> like, is it a commission? Fine. Let's do a <laughs> do commission. The commission. But then let's take some action after that and actually get it done, is what I'd say. So let's not just like let it be a commission. 
So the 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 one thing yeah. I I will just say on this that I I because I, I agree with everything you said. Um, like the politics are the one and only thing that has been holding this back. Even yeah. Republicans who you talk to at least privately will say some of the same things that we're saying, which like the pay is too low for the job, like we should raise it, but the vote is really hard. Um, what yeah. I, I have a maybe contrary opinion. I bet you would agree with okay. me. But I think it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to hear it. I don't think that there is a tremendous political cost for rate for the legislature raising the salary of the governor, the secretary of state, the state treasurer. The, like, I think most yeah. people recognize that those I mean, running state agencies is a gigantic job. You've worked with state agencies. The yeah. people who run state agencies are these yeah. are essentially 24 seven jobs. They're yeah. managing oftentimes hundreds of employees, yeah. like in the case of the attorney general. Uh, like she is the lowest paid attorney or close to it on her entire team. Um, and like, you know, you can, you can quibble with like legislators. Well, it should be a citizen legislature. It should be 50 K or 80 K or whatever. But it seems to me there should be a very broad consensus that the people we entrust with running large state agencies that are run by independently elected yeah. people should yeah. not be making the amount that they're making now at the very least a hundred percent a hundred percent well and that's kind of what finally brought me to write this op-ed you know i'm not a constant op-ed writer but it's like i've heard people just for years going well we can't vote on this now we can't vote on this now and it's like this isn't that hard of a vote it's it's a not a great it's not a super fun vote mm -hmm. but you one you can probably find bipartisan support if it's structured correctly and two, you can find creative ways to make sure that it accomplishes what voters want, which is a legislature that actually gets done for them and, um, and and creative ways to talk about it so people can understand what your real goals are. I mean, the other thing that I think people are losing sight of is we can talk all day long about equity and diversity. But if we're not willing to say, hey, you know, the current legislature is going to step up and say we're still not supporting BIPOC and women and other you know folks to serve in these seats because we're not paying them well enough, I'm going to take a, take a tough vote so I can make sure that happens for the future generation. And it's like, come on folks, like let's lean into it a little bit more and get this done. Cause the people that are at disservice are not folks maybe that have your and I's experience. You know, I want to see legislators who, you know, like Winsbay Campos. I mean, God, I remember sitting down with her and she's telling me about her life story. And I think, Oh yeah. I mean, there's so many Oregonians who are facing what she faced as a kid, you know, mm -hmm. growing up, you know, I won't speak for her, but um, and I don't want to mis misphrase it, but just that experience of like, here's what it's like to be a person who's kind of struggling in our community. Those are the folks that I think can really represent us in a way that, you know, I, I don't know that I can. Totally. And people should listen to the Senator Compost episode. I think it was our second episode ever. Maybe our first episode. <laughs> right. You uh, like did interview her. Uh, but She's it is so it cool. is so true. Like there are maybe like two or three people in the legislature who have a story like hers in terms of like the way that she grew mm -hmm. up and in terms of the Oregonians navigating those problems, it's a much greater percentage of the population who's right. navigating poverty. Like half of the kids right. in our public school system are free and reduced price lunch. I guarantee yeah. you half of the legislators did not have free and reduced. I did not have free, free and reduced price exactly. lunch, but like exactly. it's part of, you know, if, if we want to have a citizen legislature yeah. that represents the state, you got to be thinking about, yeah. you got to be thinking about more than just geography. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And we're so wedded to geography and we're so wedded to the way things used to be. And the other thing, just to riff on this for a second, I mean, I, like pay is kind of the simplest, is, is the simple, it's the simplest way to talk about it. But I also have started to think about like what systems do we need as a, on the progressive side, but maybe more holistically around legislators. Like one of the things we're seeing, there's tons of stats and research on the number of threats that come um, from anti-democracy groups, especially to women of color and leadership roles. So they'll, you know, these groups will target specifically like a woman of color leading a state agency and, and come in with like direct threats. And, and the idea is to get her out of that position, right? And it's very effective, especially when um, we haven't built up systems that provide mentorship, that provide wraparound support, or even, hey, some basic level of pay so she can, you know, she or he or whoever, you know, take a trans person, right, in that role might experience some of the same things. So I think when you've got members of our community who are willing to serve and they're asked by their community to serve, but we're not providing the kind of wraparound supports they need to bring their full voice to their work, I think that demands that we all look at it and go, wait, what can we do differently? And that's not always pay, right? Sometimes it's mentorship and community and 
Um, I don't, you know, what else, you know, the question would be like, what else can we do? And I don't know that I could answer that, but mm -hmm. I, I would just like us to have that conversation on, on both sides. Like, how totally. do we do this differently? Well, I will link in the bio to the piece that you wrote, because I think it's a good one for folks to read. And then so in our last few minutes here, I want to talk about Stuart Collective and like, oh. what what kind of work do you do? What kind of clients do you work with? We actually work together. I don't know if you're allowed to talk about like, yeah. what, I don't know if there's NDAs in any of these contracts, <laughs> yeah. but like, what kind of work do you do now? Um, and yeah. how is it? I imagine it's pretty substantially different than like running a caucus campaign arm or a coordinated yeah. campaign, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... Oh man, you know, I loved those jobs so much. Like when you talk about Future Pack and SDLF and the coordinated, I mean, the coordinated was tough, but the other two caucuses, <laughs> okay, I've recruited enough. other people to those jobs, like people who, you know, worked for me. And I said, hey, you should, you should run Future Pack. And later they go, that job is so hard. Why did you ever get me to do that? You know, it was awful. And I'm like, it is awful, but I, I loved it. And so to be honest, if I could go back and like do that every cycle, I probably would, but that would be insanity and I would be. <laughs> living a sad life. Your poor family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My poor family. <laughs> exactly. Um, so um, let's see. So the work I do now, you know, I think I, I try to emulate that as, and sometimes as much as I kind of can. So we have a team of campaign directors and campaign service providers who are within our team. And um, we work directly with um, PACs and companies and nonprofits and state agencies, as you mentioned. Um, typically what we get pulled in to do is run, you know, a campaign or run an effort that has a political focus on it. And then, you know, we've continued to add more communications work um, and are now we have a creative studio and an organizing studio because we have mm. an awesome organizer who would never come on a podcast. His name Ethan. He's great. So, you know, always like, how do we Big help? Fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a, such a great, he's so great. And um, I'll make sure he listens to this so he can hear his call out, but um, and he'll be embarrassed. <laughs> but yeah, we've added a creative studio and, a, and an organizing studio to further support our efforts, right? So when we're managing a campaign, we can add organizing or, um, you know, website development and social media and so forth. So yeah, it's always evolving and changing, but you know, we, some of our favorite clients, we have a lot of great clients, but um, one is Pacoon, which is Oregon's farm worker mm -hmm. union. And I'm just such a fan of theirs. Another one is Western State Center, um, which is also a great organization. So those are just two, but, um, you know, we love working with state agencies and others. So I think that the campaign stuff is probably not simple, but pretty, pretty aligned to like the, the, the previous work of like, but what, what, what does, what does a nonprofit, like, or, or I assume like some of this nonprofit, obviously yeah. the state agency work is totally non, non-political or at least yeah. non-electoral. Um, yeah. And I'm guessing some of the, the uh, nonprofits totally. are similar to that. What kind of work, what does that look like? Yeah. Such a good question. So um a good, typically, um, let's see, what's an example? So we don't, we kind of get into that sweet spot between lobbying and campaigns. So for a while, especially since I've had little kids so far, I've been saying like, I don't take on individual candidates. I make exceptions. Like if Tina Kotek needs help, I'm like, yeah, okay. My whole team is your team. Tell me what you need. <laughs> you know, always the Tina love, so much Tina love in our team. Um, so I make exceptions, but now we've started to take on individual candidates. So we'll just jump into like a race and, and support a candidate um, more and more as we grow. Um, but on the side, you know, on the other side, what we'll do is we'll get hired by a group like um, when Renew Oregon was around and they wanted to pass some, mm -hmm. a bill around, um, you know, addressing climate change or um, the Oregon Just Transition Alliance is getting ready for their next round of a couple of years of bills and so forth. And so we'll get hired by them to say, hey, here's our here's our goal, we, what we want to get done. And we'll really work usually directly with our director level or their board to say, okay, what do you want to get done? What's possible? We'll work with stakeholders to figure out what's possible and how to do it. Um, and then really help them navigate through that process of, you know, what's the right messaging? What's the right team? How is your team structured to get that done? Um, you know, I really like to like, just roll, like I said, I just like to roll my sleeves and do stuff. And so um, I'm not like the consultant who's on the call, like, this is what the, you know, this is the strategy. I'm like, no, okay, let me like, you know, I'm going to help you write the plan and then we're going to show up and knock the doors or be at the rally with you. Um, it's really how I try to approach it. And I joke that I like to, I really love to do the session breaker bills, which is not a very funny joke, but I always- What is it? Like the stuff that blows up the session? The, the bigger the blow up, the more excited I am to help. <laughs> I wish they wouldn't blow it up, but you know, sometimes those bills do. We did the Renew stuff, to Hustle 2020. We did the Student Success Act, which didn't blow anything up. It was a uh -huh. big success. 
Um, but we were, you know, in the in the background of that one, um, and then did farm worker overtime a couple sessions oh, ago. Wow. And then you really have been going. in the, those are the <laughs> the uh, hot yeah. potato items. So the Renew Oregon yeah. one was the um, that was the one that forced the walkout, where Kate Brown then said, "Okay, I'm going to do executive order." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but you know, uh, without giving everything away, I think sometimes you've got your eye on the prize, and an executive order can be a great That's outcome. The job done. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're kind of like, what do, you know? What do you really need, and what's the long game, and how do you? I mean, also like we kind of we're really a coordinated crew of, of folks with kind of broadly similar goals on the left, and so how do you kind of keep these coalitions and teams and relationships in a good place through all these different. Um, various issues and fights and it's you know it's been a really tough couple of years for folks and it, you know you've yeah. been right in the middle of it through 2020 and I think yeah. we're really building re- rebuilding getting ready for 24. Yeah well Kathleen we are at time and I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the pod and being so open about your professional journey I think it'll be very useful yeah. particularly for our, our younger listeners who are trying to find their own way um, if folks are interested in learning okay. more about you or Stuart Collective, where would you direct them? Yeah, um, well, that's so kind. And I just want to say thank you for having me on. This was a real pleasure. I hope I haven't said too much. I've tried to keep no, it No, 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 it was great. It was awesome. Level. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm such a big fan. And thanks for all the work you're doing. Um, you can go to stuartcollective.co and find all the things you need to know about us if you're interested. Perfect. I will add the link to the show description. And uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. And we will see you back here next week. Thanks, Ben.